These are the stories of ordinary British people, told through their diaries, letters, and memoirs, as their lives were changed forever by what they called the Great War. By 1915, it was clear that the war that was supposed to have been over by Christmas had no end in sight. It's all rushing upon us now, what the machines of death will bring to innocent men and their wives and families. Well, all I possess is doing his duty. If he was sent to the front, I could only say, Go. We are all feeling terribly shaken, and hardly anyone sleeps. The very children are marching instead of walking, and using old pieces of tin pails as drums. Dear mother, last night we slept within hearing of the guns again. In a night or so, we shall be right back in the thick of it, I expect. I'm afraid the last operation was not a success, and I shall have to undergo another. And yet the greatest battles were to come. Here, yeah. we're going strong, peppering the hunt night and day. Very hard work it is, continuous shooting, but I think he's giving way all right. We're gradually beginning to slowly heave him back. We keep on looking at the photos of little David. And I know how you love watching him grow up. Bye-bye, my Ernest. I just adore you. Hub. Uncovered from attics and basements, archives and libraries, their original accounts are here brought back to life as never before. Before the First World War, Britain was in her imperial pomp. People were proud of their island nation. They lived at the heart of an empire, which seemed to spread wealth and civilization across the world. Alan Lloyd was 25. From a wealthy Midlands family, his was a charmed life. He was more interested in travel, his custom-built sports car, and rowing with his prestigious Leander Rowing Club than settling down. So when he announced his intention to marry Dorothy Hewitson, known as Dodds, her parents objected. Beloved little Dot, I've discussed everything with Pa and Ma. Perhaps you and your Pa and Ma would be able to come here to see us and talk things over. When they come, we shall probably be able to fix everything up with a little better understanding. I hope your father won't say the things about me that he said to me to my mother. It's hardly cricket to a prospective son-in-law. I'm afraid we'll never get along very well. Dorothy's parents relented, but by the time they were married, war had already broken out, and Alan had volunteered for the army. 
he would now spend more time at the front than with his new wife or their baby son, David. Germany had invaded France and Belgium in 1914. They'd pushed the French and British back through force of numbers. By winter, the Germans had been fought to a standstill. During 1915, the two sides faced each other in lines of trenches, known to history as the Western Front. In July, Allen joined thousands of troops at a critical point on the British line, the city of Ypres. Death and injury rates for British officers were higher than even those for private soldiers. Allen was taking on one of the most dangerous jobs in the army. It's a funny thing, but sometimes I feel awfully close to small wife. and sort of see her sitting and thinking of Hubbins. Then I get very bucked, jump about and yell. I could see small wife sitting with a book on her lap, which she wasn't reading. And she was staring away at nothing, thinking of Hubbins. I was by myself in a field and on a lovely evening and I shouted out, small wife, and I capered about like a small boy. My very ownest, belovedest old darling Hubbins. I've got baby close to me. It's lovely here now and it's getting like summer and I want my Hubbins awful badly. It's better being here than at Edgbaston. I don't want to get fed up seeing a lot of females with their husbands at home. Hubbins wants to see small wife very bad. Across Britain, the reality had begun to dawn that this war would touch everyone. Do you enjoy your food? Hallie Miles was 56, the wife of an Olympic sports star. Together they ran a fashionable restaurant near Charing Cross in London. It specialised in an unusual cuisine, vegetarian food. In these times of war, Hallie woke to sights and sounds she'd never known before. We are all feeling terribly shaken, and hardly anyone sleeps. The streets seem full of people all night long, and the steady tramp of the territorials as they march to headquarters seems never to cease. There are such small and subtle changes, too. The very children are marching instead of walking and are carrying bits of stick as bayonets and using old pieces of tin pails as drums. Close to our flat is a recruiting center for territorials and what sights we see from our windows. We see the women bringing the men to the recruiting offices and waiting outside whilst they're being enlisted. Then the men who had entered the building in civilian clothes 
working clothes, all sorts of clothes. Leave it in spick and span uniform. And the women are handed the men's everyday garments. I have seen them hug these clothes to them as if they were living people and weep over them as they turn away, leaving their men behind. Kate Fry was 36. She lived not far away in the then rather down at heel Pimlico. Her fiance, John Collins, was a Territorial Army volunteer. Great meetings are being organized to help inspire the men of the country. The women are being implored to send their men forth. Well, all I possess is doing his duty. If he was sent to the front, terrible as it would be. I could only say, go. Kate and John had been engaged for 10 years. John was an out of work actor and Kate's family had hit hard times. They didn't have the money to marry or to set up home in the way society thought respectable. With the outbreak of war, they might have missed their chance. A letter from John saying he's expecting a letter every minute giving him instructions to join his unit. He writes in very low spirits. We never seem to get any nearer getting married. And don't suppose we ever shall now. It's all rushing upon us now a huge welter of realization of what we're in for, what the machines of death will bring to innocent men and their wives and families. In the years leading up to war, Kate had been an active suffragette, campaigning to win the vote and equal rights for women. They know we have got to have votes, and to think that they've got us to this state and some women are thinking it necessary and right to do the most awful burnings and things in order to bring the question forward. Oh, what a fuss to cause, and in a so-called civilized country. Now Kate's Suffragette Society opened a workroom making uniforms for the army. She was asked to take charge. I am to run the workroom. I tried to take it calmly, but my brain reeled a bit. There's a splendid forewoman and 11 girls in the hall hard at work. Miss McGowan showed me the books and I tried to keep calm. Tables arriving, telephoning for machines, more girls, etc. Paying out money for wages, paying money in the bank and lots of people in and out. I cleared up, did the accounts, and finished up the week's work and left everything straight for Monday. Women across the country stepped up to do their bit. We have women tram guards on the cars here now. Very business like they are, too, in their uniforms. But it must be very tiring, so much standing. The passengers are mostly very considerate to them. There are two very dashing, be powdered and painted young ladies who come sometimes. They smoke cigarettes, and yesterday I asked them to peel the onions and potatoes. They attack the job with shrieks and chuckles of joy. I remarked to one of the other workers that they seemed to be having a high time over it. Well, she said, I don't suppose they've ever done that sort of thing before. They are the nieces of the Duchess of Wellington. More and more women were working as more and more men went to fight. Twenty-five. 
26-year-old Reg Evans was from Hertfordshire. He'd swapped his days in a factory for life in the trenches. In 1915, he won the Distinguished Conduct Medal for his bravery. He wrote to his mother every few days. Dear mother, last night we slept within hearing of the guns again. In a night or so, we shall be right back in the thick of it, I expect. So I hope the weather keeps fine, for if it isn't, it spoils everything. It is to be hoped that all the girls whose acquaintance I have made won't take to writing for you for information, because just between ourselves, it will get your hands full. I have told several out here that I pray the gear, I'm going to come back and marry them. Don't get alarmed, though. They're always being told that. Well, I don't think there's much more I can say at present. Your affectionate son, Reg. In February 1916, Reg was shot in the face. The bullet blew away his upper jaw. Dear Mother, I'm afraid you won't get a letter from me in my own handwriting whilst I'm in this hospital, because all our letters have to be copied for fear of infection. There is nothing you could send at all, as I cannot eat or smoke. I'm afraid you will have to prepare yourself to receive a rather uglier duckling than before. Fond love from your affectionate son, Reg. Reg needed specialist care and was transferred back to hospital in Britain. He knew he would be lucky to recover. Nineteen sixteen. It was still deadlock in the trenches. Back in Britain, people were coming face to face with the human cost of this war. I have just seen the wounded soldiers brought in ambulances to Charing Cross Hospital. One of them feebly waved his hand to the crowd. They were very serious cases. A policeman stands at the top of the street and lets no traffic go down it. The strand traffic slows down as it comes to this sacred spot and everything passes in a sort of hushed manner. As hospitals struggled to cope with the sheer numbers of wounded, doctors confronted the horrific new injuries caused by 20th century weapons. There are wounds far worse than anything we have met before. Men without half their faces. Men burned and maimed to the condition of animals. Harold Gillies was a 34-year-old military surgeon. At the beginning of 1916, horrified by what he'd seen, Gillies persuaded the Army Medical Corps to let him open a specialist unit at a hospital in Aldershot. Here, he would treat men with severe facial wounds, wounds previously thought untreatable.
This work was pioneering. Gillies would become the father of modern plastic surgery. One of his first facial patients was Reg Evans. I've been feeling pretty rotten. My face is so stitched up again, I can scarcely talk, let alone feed. Now I've been thinking of the times we had together and the heaps of grub, always nice and well cooked I had when I was at home. Couldn't I do with some of it now, eh? Some of that pork and the apple sauce with the potatoes, parsnips, etc. <laughs> and I shall make up for it when I do start again. Fond love from your affectionate son, Reg. Gillies hoped to use his pioneering techniques to rebuild Reg's face. But there was no guarantee of success. In 1914, more than a million men had volunteered for the army. But by 1916, the government was forced to bring in conscription. Kate Fry had been engaged to her fiancé, John Collins, for 10 years. He was an officer in the artillery, awaiting his call to the front. Kate knew it would just be a matter of time. John came along at one o'clock. He's got leave till tomorrow. Took the 4.30 to Hove, had a carriage to ourselves, and I suggested we should get married at Christmas and share a flat. I've been so miserable all the week, tears trickling into my boiled egg at supper, that I feel something must happen. When next I write, if our plans do not go astray, I shall no longer be Kate Fry, but Mrs. J.R. Collins. And all I can say is, I feel I am craving and praying that my marriage shall be a success. Kate and John were far from alone. More people got married in the first two years of war than ever since records began. The figure in 1915 was one and a half times that of 1910, with nearly 400,000 weddings. At his specialist hospital in Aldershot, Harold Gillies was preparing for Reg's operation. His assistants made detailed drawings of the wound. I just have to go ahead with the ingenuity of my own mind and the principles of surgery behind it. Little by little, those principles evolve. All the time we are fumbling towards new methods and new results. My small staff and I feel that we are on trial. Already a war hero, Undergoing this treatment required from Reg a new kind of courage. Patients often found it too painful and traumatic to continue. Reg's upper lip had been shot away. Gilly's technique was to cut two flaps from the surrounding skin and stitch them together 
to create a new lip. It was delicate and uncertain work. It is quite possible to sew up a lower lip which has lost nearly a third of its bulk without causing a serious functional or aesthetic deformity. Whereas a similar loss of the upper lip cannot be produced without very serious impairment of function accompanied by a most unpleasant effect. In Reg's case, it was clear that one operation would not be enough. I've been feeling so rotten. I'm afraid the last operation was not a success and I shall have to undergo another. The look of my mouth is completely altered again now and not, I'm sorry to say, for the better. I only wish I wasn't so irritable, though I know you shall forgive even that in your loving son. Reg. These wounded boys are a brave lot. Once we start their repair, their morale usually leads the pace, as evidenced by many a moustache perking up with a bit of spit and twist. No, it's not their morale. It's their mutilation that bewilders me. Reg faced many more months in hospital, not knowing if his treatment would ever be successful. By now, Alan Lloyd had been near Ypres for nearly a year, and the monotony, mixed with sudden fear and danger, was weighing him down. Beloved little angel wife, I've got the spirit of unrest in me again. I want to get out on the trek. I don't care where to, but I'm fed up with sitting in dugouts and watching Huns. Things have quietened down here again, but it was a big show while it lasted. The papers seem quite pleased about it. Did I tell you about the streams of Huns who rushed out of their trenches with their hands up and came over to us to give themselves up? One Hun officer came up to me and told me I was to take charge of him as he was an officer. He said in French I was to take him to his place of captivity. I told him I wish I could as it would be England. <laughs> All the Tommies roared and bellowed with laughter at this. When I tell you that this is the worst spot in the whole British line and that our battery position is supposed to be the worst of any round here, so the general says, and he should know. You will realize that there is plenty of invigorating exercise or work for me. I should say, it's far easier to do a balaclava charge the star of the show and all your pals round you just like a rug of scrum. And to go out in your wires on a dark night with a thousand shells, no trenches to protect you. All by yourself with one signaler. I can tell you, my darling, it's not too easy. In June 1916, Allen was one of thousands of men moved south to the area around the River Somme. This was the southernmost section of the line held by the British, and up till now, one of the quietest. Here, British commanders were planning to unleash, for the first time, the full force of Britain's new army. 120,000 men, backed by nearly 1,500 artillery pieces, would advance along a 15-mile front. 
And at home, many people sensed that the big push would soon take place. Finally, in a quiet wartime ceremony, came the moment Kate and John had waited for, for 10 years. My wedding day and my birthday. We walked up the church, Mother and I together, and she and Agnes went into a seat. Then I saw John coming from the vestry. I was only conscious that he looked all right and not nervous. I spoke very, very slowly, I noticed, as if I were weighing every word. And I said obey, most deliberately and carefully. I would have rather left it out altogether, but had come to the conclusion that if I had the Church of England marriage service at all, there wasn't much more objection to that one word than to many of the others. Taxi to the Great Central Hotel. We went straight into dinner about 8.15 and had nine rather bad courses. Ours was a gorgeous room, the bed in an alcove. We had meant to have a fire. It would have been nice. I laughed a lot at first. Later, I shed a tear or two, and John would turn up the light to look at me. Then he saw my tears and wept himself. But we were very happy. Theirs would be a fleeting happiness. John would soon be on his way to the front. In 1916, John Collins got the call his new wife, Kate, had been dreading. John came in with the news that their destination is to be France. It seems to be getting nearer now. He is quite cheerful about it. That's one good thing. Every day, there is a train from Victoria which takes the soldiers who've been home on a few days leave back to France and the cruel trenches. Well, I determined I would go to Victoria. It was a perfect day of brilliant sunshine. When we were called at 7.30, it seemed like the death knell. <laughs> I was the first to get out of bed as soon as John would let me go. And we both dressed and had breakfast together. I cut sandwiches and stowed them in his knapsack, packed up also a lump of bread, butter, potted meat, etc. John went off at 9.15 with his knapsack, water bottle, glasses, etc., etc., slung on him, on his bicycle. I drove up to the station just as the battery marched up. At first, the platform was empty. Only the train with steam up waiting. And then there began to arrive the Tommies and the officers and the mothers, wives and sisters and sweethearts. The men looked very brave, but their faces were very set. Some of them hardly dared look at the brave women walking by their side. Soon the platform was crowded with this wonderful army of men and women who were fighting back the tears so bravely and each helping the other by their own courage. I had put in John's hand an envelope containing a silver identification bracelet with his name, etc., and on the back from KPC, and told him to open it when he liked. Then came the moment when the first dreaded whistle sounded. It seemed more like a trumpet call than the whistle of an ordinary engine. 
The very air became suddenly charged with intensest feeling. We all held our breaths. Perfect silence reigned. For we knew the goodbyes were being said. We knew that for some, the last kiss was being given. He got in and kissed me and the train moved off. He looked at me, then turned his head. I suppose he couldn't bear any more. But I smiled at him. Then the train went faster. I just moved down the platform to avoid the official group and then turned and looked and waved until he was out of sight. I never saw such a sight as it was when the khaki arms were waving out the windows to those dear ones who were left standing on the platform as long as the train was in sight. I think I had a great feeling of thankfulness that it was over and that I had come through such a terrible ordeal. I have started a choir and a concert party called The Loyal Choir as my special war work. It is a tremendous interest to me. We are having a series of patriotic teas in the EM restaurant for our wounded soldiers once a fortnight and a concert afterwards. The Loyal Choir sang at the first patriotic tea last week. We had a number of wounded soldiers as our guests. Summer 1916. The British Army was nearly ready for its biggest ever attack. Alan Lloyd was in the midst of the preparations. Is small wife happy? Please, because hub is. And there's no reason why small wife should be anxious because we're quite all right. Hub is very well and enjoying himself in spite of plenty of hard work and disturbed nights. He sleeps like a log and eats like a horse and dreams of his little wife. Isn't he bad? July the 1st, 1916. The Battle of the Somme began. Many had high hopes that this would break the terrible trench stalemate at last. We had the news that we were the picked battalion to take the lead in the attack. When we got back to our billets near the line, what a change in the village. Everything was made into hospitals. All the cafes were closed. And great preparations had been made for the great day. No one knew, even on the morning of the first, what time the attack was being made. But the artillery started at 6.30. And at 7.30, we heard the CO shout, the boys are going over. And we could see the boys going like mad across no man's land. Yeah, we're going strong and peppering the Hun night and day. Very hard work it is, continuous shooting. But I think he's giving way all right. We're gradually beginning to slowly heave him back. And after a while, he may very likely go with a run. 
We got a very important wood last night. Without much resistance, and his counterattacks aren't what they were. We covered ourselves with glory. We paid a terrible price. It was our colonel's idea that we should take it cool and easy and go over at the slope. And this we carried out even so far as having cigarettes in our mouths. As soon as we were all on top, the Germans started sending big shrapnel shells. Terrible things. I heard when we got into the first line of German trenches that 15 of our boys were killed and wounded coming across. The colonel watched them mount the steps, and his last remarks were, Isn't it wonderful? Our reserves were calling out, Bravo, Manchester's good luck, cheerio, and every word of praise that such calmness should bring to their minds. Down they fell, one by one. It was hell. The first day of the Somme was the bloodiest in British military history. 20,000 men were killed and 37,000 wounded. The battle would last for another 140 days. Writing from the thick of the fighting, Alan Lloyd dared to hope that this would be the beginning of the end and that he would soon go home. Excuse this paper, but war is war and dust is dust and here we've plenty of both. And very warm too, little wife. Hot as heaven. Please, would you like Hubbins with you? Because he'd like to be there. I keep on looking at the photos of little David. And I think he looks an awful little sportsman. And you can see he loves the dogs. Doesn't care a button what they do. His great big fists. And puckered forehead are ripping. And I know how you love watching him grow up. And so will Hub. A lot of indications that the war won't last a vast time longer. I think the Hun is getting enough of it now. But we've got the race well in hand. But as we quicken the stroke, a really good crew has its work cut out to keep well together. And that's what we've got to do. So cheer up. We're a big heavy boat and clumsy but we're going well together now. And the coaches on the bank seem to know what they're driving at. The people in the grandstand are beginning to stand up, ready to yell. And we're going up, my dear. Up, up. And I can almost see the crowd again. Leander. Leander. Well, road, Leander, you have them. Shove them in, got them by the cat. And the terrific crash of God save the king as Leander rose in ahead. We're an old veteran crew, and we got a bad start. And Leander got a bad start, but in the end, they won. And we'll win. And that's all there is to it. Bye-bye, my Ernest. I just adore you, Hub.
By Christmas 1916, the Battle of the Somme was over. It had not brought the hoped-for breakthrough, and altogether, nearly a million men had been killed or wounded. The British Army emerged a more battle-hardened force, ready to take the fight to the weakened Germans as never before. But victory was a long way off. Reg Evans had been in hospital for nearly a year, undergoing pioneering plastic surgery on his shattered face. His first operation had not been a success but further surgery offered hope. Dear mother, I'm having x-ray treatment and massage for my face, which is getting on now. It's beginning to look as if I shan't be home for Christmas after all. Oh, how I long for my liberty again. When I think about getting out, it, well, it seems so grand. Of course, I mustn't grumble, because everybody has been so good to me, but... ...still I am weary of doing nothing. On Christmas Day, thousands of soldiers given leave would arrive at London's Victoria Station. It was a white Christmas that year. For Kate, it brought a letter from John. Dearest, this Christmas I hope you are having a peaceful time. Don't ask me how I'm spending mine. Even the men who have been out here three times have never seen anything like this. Christmas will have more memories for me than I can say. The great joy of Christmas has, however, turned up this evening in the shape of two letters from you. I'm off to bed, which is the only comfortable place to be in. Fondest love and many kisses, John. Soon, thoughts turned to what terrible struggles the new year would bring. The passing of the old year at midnight was so intensely solemn. No clashing bells were to be heard. Even Big Ben was silent. I believe that some of the city churches rang muffled peals. We know that it will be the greatest war year of all. And we wonder what it will bring. For Reg, at least, the new year brought good news. That. Dear mother, I'm expecting to leave hospital this week or next. My new teeth are fairly comfortable, but I have to take them out when I want to eat. That. On Thursday, the king and queen came without a minute's notice. They were as nice as can be, and it was also informal. Captain Gillies was doing an operation at the time, but came up later. And the king said how interested he was in his work, and how splendid it was to think that men who might have been hideously disfigured for life could now look forward with hope to the future. Of course, yours truly came in for a little attention. Just a little informal presentation, my dear, that's all. Still, it's stimulating, isn't it? Well, good night, Mother. Heaps of love, and I'll soon be back with you as fit as ever. Your loving son, Reg. Reg served in the army 
until the end of the war, though he never returned to the trenches. After the war, he became a newsagent in Staffordshire. He married, had four children, and died in 1943. John Collins spent nearly two years at the front, winning a military cross for bravery and being promoted to acting major. After the war, he and Kate moved to Buckinghamshire and continued to work in theatre without much success. They remained together until John died in 1958. Kate died a year later. She had kept her diary for 71 years, but with no known heirs, it was finally recovered from a stranger's basement in 2009. A few weeks after Alan's death in August 1916, his widow Dorothy received a letter. Dear Mrs Lloyd, the writing of this letter to you is the saddest task I have ever had to do. Poor old Alan was very badly hit and never had any chance of pulling through, but he never knew it. He seemed quite happy and said he thought he'd be all right and he died in about 20 minutes. He was the bravest man that I ever knew and it is the simple truth. He was such a true friend to me that I feel I have lost what was best for me in this life out here. And I'm very, very sorry. But I know that you will be proud of what he was and all he did. Just as the clock struck 12 midnight, sound was heard of one zeppelin coming back, a long black thing against the stars. We heard that some poor devil just couldn't stand it any longer. He ran outside with one of his tools and cut his throat. Just a few lines there to let you know that I am still in the land of the living. Oh, my dear boy, I do pray that you will be spared. If I lost you, I don't know what I should do. 